2 Kings chapter 20. We'll begin reading verse number 12. The Bible says, At that time, Baradak Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall uh, be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the good singing. We're thankful for the old songs of Zion. And Lord, we're thankful they're just as true today as those, uh, the days when they were penned. Lord, they exalt you. And oh Lord, they give us hope in these days. Thank you, Father, for another privilege to open the Word of God and be able to read and hear from heaven. And I pray that, Lord, you would speak to us now, that you would uh, certainly stir our hearts, stir our nests for the honor and glory of God. And I pray, as we have been praying during these days, that you would send great revival to our land. Uh, Lord, not something that's just temporal, but something that would be uh, uh, eternal, something that would be supernatural, something that man couldn't squelch out, something that would transform uh, uh, your people into thy likeness, and something that would uh, uh, cause many sinners to be uh, brought into the fo fold of God, that we may s bring sons unto glory and see many saved by the marvelous grace of God. Now, Father, I pray you'd help us. You know we stand in need of you and your presence. Lord, without you, we can do nothing. I pray for those that are watching. God, you'd speak to their hearts. You'd encourage them. You would edify them even where they are. Now, Father, uh, get glory to your glorious name. Help us this day. We'll thank you and praise you for what you do, for it's in the holy name of the Holy One of Israel, the name of the Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. And amen. I want to look at uh, several things here in these verses uh, to get to the thought tonight. I want you to notice, first of all, the trauma mentioned in verse number six. Uh, it says, or in verse number 12, it says, At that time, Baradak Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah. Here it is. For he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Uh, we'd read the first part of the chapter, you find that. Hezekiah was sick, Isaiah came and gave him a death sentence and said, you're going to die. Yeah. And Hezekiah wept sore, he turned his face to the wall, uh, wept sore, uh, and Isaiah the prophet hadn't even got out of the courtyard of the palace, uh, and God told him to go back, and God restored unto Hezekiah 15 years unto his life. Uh, I've got news for you, uh, everybody has a death sentence on their life, uh, and unless we turn to God and uh, 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 repent and wait, and ask God uh, to forgive us. Uh, we're going to spend eternity in hell. But thanks be unto God, uh, those uh, that turn to God and put their faith and trust in Him, uh, uh, hallelujah unto God, the death sentence rolled away uh, and were granted eternal life. But there was a trauma. Hezekiah had been sick. Uh, word got out he was going to die. Uh, I, I, I'm glad to report God uh, extended to him some life. But the king of Babylon sent his son and some men to extend their 
condolences and to bring him a present. We see the trauma. Now notice the treasures in verse 13. The Bible says, And Hezekiah hearkened unto them, showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious ointment, and all of the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Uh, 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 Hezekiah took them in, he took their gift, he took their present, uh, and he began to show them his kingdom, and he showed them all the precious things uh, of the Lord. He showed them the tr uh, uh, wonderful treasures, uh, the vessels that were used in the house of God, and the very spices that were used in the offerings unto God, uh, and the ointment of the apothecary, and all the things that uh, uh, God had told Moses to establish under the law. Hezekiah shows them all those things. Uh, can I say for years uh, we have proclaimed that we're to be a peculiar people, we're to be a separate people, uh, 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 but my dear friends, rather than take the gospel to a lost and dying world uh, we've allowed the world to come in and see all the treasures of God uh, and today as we are assembled here, uh, there are false churches making mockeries of the things uh, that we uh, hold as treasures that we hold as precious uh, and uh, uh, my dear friends a lot of the things that we esteem as holy and godly uh, they have trampled underfoot uh, and they've made a mockery of them uh, uh, what treasures are you talking about preacher I'm talking about the treasures of the promises of God uh, we hold the word of God to be valuable uh, uh, the most precious thing uh, and they've taken it and they've bastardized it and they've changed it uh, and they've rewritten it uh, uh, to where it glorifies man and not God uh, uh, they've taken this treasure uh, and bastardized it uh, uh, can I say the precious uh, a treasure of preaching. Uh, God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. Uh, hey, and they made a mockery of preaching. Uh, uh, now it's all about uh, uh, social agendas uh, and teaching that uh, glorifies man and things uh, uh, that uh, propagate humanism uh, and false doctrine uh, and preachers uh, uh, like the one you've got uh, and like the ones we enjoy to come in. Uh, we're looked at as ignorant, unlearned men uh, throw me in that company that's what they called Peter uh, hallelujah I'd rather have a touch of God uh, and the power of God uh, and to stand and preach what thus saith the Lord uh, uh, than to have a crowd in a following but it's precious to us uh but not to them. Uh, I thought about the preciousness uh, and the treasure of prayer. Uh, oh, what a blessing when God's people uh, grabbed the horns of the altar and began to call on God and exalt God in prayer. Uh, uh, prayer is the most powerful thing on earth. Uh, prayer is what moves heaven towards earth. Uh, and prayer is what will get the job done. Uh, they make a mockery of our prayer. They say a few words uh, and it's seasoned with ideologies but it doesn't move the heart of God uh, I thought about the treasure of praise can I say Baptists have been singing and praising God and testifying uh, uh, to the greatness of God for 2,000 years uh, in the last 30 years we've had this praise and worship movement uh, and they make a mockery of what real praise is all about uh, then there's the treasure of God's people God's people are precious in God's sight they are royalty in God's sight. Uh, it's a blessing to be associated and accepted in the beloved uh, and uh, uh, have uh, uh, folks that uh, are saved that uh, we can not only enjoy worshiping with here, but we'll spend all of eternity with the precious people of God. And one thing that we're going through in this tragedy right now is we can't congregate as the people of God, uh, and we miss that wonderful treasure. You see... Hezekiah had been sick. There was a trauma. We see the treasures. Can I say, this virus hit and some folks got sick. And unfortunately, some died. It's cost some treasures to be taken from us. We see the trauma. We see the treasures. But notice the travesty in verse 17. The Bible says, Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons, 
that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. What a terrible travesty that Hezekiah got the word from the man of God uh, that uh, all the things that had been stored up and passed down from generation to generation to be used for the service of the house of God, uh, the things that were treasures in the house of God was going to be carried away. Not only that, also his sons. What a travesty. What a travesty. You see, my dear friends, when you let the world have an inch, they take a whole lot more than that. But then notice, if you will, Hezekiah's thought process. Look at verse 19. This is troubling to me. The Bible says, Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord. Yes, God's word's always good. But notice what he concludes with, which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? The man of God just delivered a message to Hezekiah that because of his ignorance and showing all the treasures of his house to the king of Babylon's son, that there's coming a day when Babylon's going to come and take it all and take his children. And Hezekiah says, that's all right, as long as there's peace in my day. As long as it's good for me, I really don't care about that terrible he was interested in peace without conflict can I tell you what's been wrong with Christianity for the last five decades we've enjoyed peace without conflict and my dear friends as we're faced with tragedy and travesty today people are still crying peace and safety when there is no peace and safety People are willing to sell out because they don't want conflict. In contrast, what Hezekiah says, is he don't want what I'm about ready to read to you. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 11 verse 35 in the middle of that verse says this, Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. Uh, they were stoned, they were sown asunder, uh, were tempted, were slain with the sword. Uh, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, uh, of whom the world was not worthy. Uh, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. Uh, that's what our forefathers of the faith uh, endured that you and I could have a church today, uh, that you and I could have the Word of God today, uh, that you and I could know what it was it is to be saved today. Uh, they endured hardship uh, that we could have heaven, uh, but the mentality of Hezekiah has been perpetrated uh, and propagated to our day uh, uh, where folks no longer care about uh, 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 standing as God the course uh, and standing in the gap and making up the hedge uh, and being what God would have us to be we want peace and safety rather than pass on the things of God to the next generation I want to preach with this thought tonight I want to preach on peace at all cost there's many people that are saved going to heaven but they want peace at all cost they don't want conflict they don't want any opposition. They don't want any obstacles. Uh, they want to come to church when they can to come to church uh, and they want to just go through the motions. Uh, but don't ask anything of them. They don't want any conflict. And if it comes down to whether or not you're going to stand for Christ or if you're going to cower down in the corner, they'll cower down in the corner at all times uh, because they want peace without conflict. They don't want to have to make a stand. They don't want to have to make a choice. They don't want their faith to be on trial. They don't want to have to face opposition. They want to be a Christian in name only, but they don't want to have to bear the cross of being a Christian. And can I say, for the hope of peace, they'll forfeit anything. And we're seeing it in our day and age. I appreciate the many folks that have reached out to me that are chomping at the bit, ready to get back to church, ready to worship God, ready to go out and take the gospel into our neighborhoods. Thank God for some uh, uh, that are willing to do whatever it takes to serve Jesus. But there's quite a few I haven't heard a thing from. They're certainly content not having 
the treasures of God. You see, for the hope of peace, some will forfeit their liberties. When 9-11 happened and George W. Bush stood up and said, we need the Patriot Act to ensure that it will never happen again, people sold out their liberties for the hope of airplanes never flying out, falling out of the sky again. People were scared to death that terrorism was going to overthrow our country, and they sold out their liberties. As we sit here tonight, we're faced with a virus, with a strain of the flu. As Jordan brought out in Sunday school, it's nothing new. There's seven strains of this thing. It's not new. It has uh, been around for a long time. Uh, it's just mutated into what we now know as COVID-19. Uh, uh, can I say something? Uh, uh, for fear of COVID-19, there are people who will forfeit their liberties, and they have. There are people who have been upset with me. Preacher, you shouldn't pursue to upset the governor. You shouldn't pursue to upset the government. You shouldn't pursue to do... Aren't you glad, hallelujah, some uh, uh, 200 years ago there's some that stood up against the face of tyranny? Uh, aren't you glad there's some who dumped tea in Boston Harbor? Uh, aren't you glad for Patrick Henry who said, Give me liberty or give me death? Uh, aren't you glad uh, for some farmers uh, and some Christians uh, took pitch, uh, pitchforks and muskets uh, and they stood uh, their ground and they faced the great army on the face of the earth uh, and they overcame uh, and they, as a result uh, we have the greatest country on the face of the earth uh, but tyranny reigns uh, when men won't stand up for liberty mm, they'll forfeit their liberties what the liberties are you talking about well how about uh, just a couple in the Bill of Rights the very uh, uh, preamble to the Constitution says that we should have freedom of religion and right to assemble that's the first one. Can I say the Attorney General of the United States of America is watching these states very closely because he said it is an inalienable right. What that means, uh, that right came from God, not man. The freedom to worship, and the freedom to assemble. And yet there are many who say, well, preacher, we've got to do what the governor says. Well, the governor's supposed to do what the Constitution says. And the governor is not unless people call him on the carpet for it. How about the freedom of speech? You realize we have that freedom in America? But yet, in New York City right now, the mayor is telling uh, 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 his uh, 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 citizens uh, that if they catch anybody out, anybody not wearing a mask, anybody not doing what he tells them to do, to report them. They're not allowed to speak their mind. They're not allowed to have an opinion. Uh, they're not allowed to have freedom. Can I say that's what happens in Moscow, not America. That's what happens in Beijing, not America. We have the freedom of speech. Uh, we have the freedom to assemble. Uh, we have the freedom to protest in America. Hey, uh, uh, the governor of Michigan don't like it. Uh, the governor of Virginia don't like it. Uh, the governor of North Carolina don't like it. Uh, uh, they've tried to stop it. Uh, and even in Frankfurt, uh, in Kentucky, uh, they put up barriers around uh, uh, the state capitol saying you can't protest here. Uh, au contraire, the Constitution tells us we can. Uh, and by the way, the citizens own the capital, not the governor. But yet, for peace, people will forfeit their liberties. The right to bear arms, the Second Amendment to the Constitution. All across this nation, there are governors saying, we've got to close up gun shops, make it illegal to sell guns. Uh, and all the while, they're turning criminals out of our prisons. Uh, and I say there's a report after report after report of people getting out of jail and within 24 hours uh, creating heinous crimes, uh, uh, some murder, some rape, uh, some thievery. Uh, 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 they've done this when they should have been locked up all along and they want us not to be able to defend ourselves. And I say the Second Amendment is in the Constitution not only for us to defend our castle, our own homes, but to rise up against tyranny if the need calls for it. And I say this, how about the liberty, the freedom against unreasonable searches and seizures? It's in the Bill of Rights. That means they can't come in and seize your stuff or search your stuff without a warrant. Can I say, the Gestapo was used of Hitler to go kick doors down and take people's books and their Bibles away from them. Can I say, America said we will not have that. And if somebody from uh, uh, the government comes to your house, they better have a warrant. And yet, we'll give away our 
liberties for the hope of peace. If you just give me a little check for stimulus money, if you just give me a little bread and a little milk, a little cheese, a little toilet paper, we'll satisfy that you have my liberties. Just give me peace so I don't have to worry about any conflict. Well, friend, if you sell out your liberties, you're going to face more than conflict. You're going to face slavery to a government of tyranny. For the hope of peace, some will forfeit their liberties. Can I say, for the hope of peace, some will forfeit their legacy. Look at verse 18 again. The Bible says this, And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, they shall take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Hezekiah said, as long as it's good and peaceful for me, I don't care. His very sons were going to be carried away to become slaves and imprisoned in Babylon, be made eunuchs to where they would never be able to have sons. He is throwing away his legacy for the hope of peace and safety. Those of you that will not stand up for righteousness, you're throwing your children away to the devil. Some of you, in bowing down to tyranny, are throwing your grandchildren away. Throwing your children away. You're saying, I don't care what happens to them as long as I don't have to make a stand. I'm glad for some that care about the legacy, that want to make certain their children understand what the truth of the Word of God is, want their children to understand what history is really about, you see, for years I've said we've elected officials to go to Washington. They don't even read the Constitution, but they swear into it, saying that they'll uphold it. And then every t the whole time they're in office, all they do is break the Constitution. It's about high time that a lot of these politicians get back to reading the Constitution because that's what they've been sworn to uphold. And it's about high time that Christians read it and start living by it. We ought to live by the Bible. We ought to live by the Constitution because that grants us the freedoms to allow us to live by the Bible. That's why our forefathers came here. You realize the forefathers of this great nation used the Bible and Judeo-Christian laws in order to write the Constitution, and yet we'll let some pencil-neck geek politician tell us we can't assemble. God help us. We are forfeiting our legacy and I say, if churches cease as we have known them, what hope will there be for the next generation if Jesus doesn't come? We going to let crossroads have them? With their feel-good worship and non-truth, giving another gospel rather than the true gospel? Or are we going to fight for our kids? Or are we going to stand up for what's right? See? The hope of peace, and for the hope of peace, some will forfeit their liberties. Some will forfeit their legacy. Some will forfeit their livelihoods. As we sit here tonight, over 22 million Americans have lost their jobs. All for a senseless act of the government. Say, preacher, there was a threat for a virus. Yeah, and there will be a threat for one next year too and one for the year after that and one for the year after that. There's always a threat for something. But we shouldn't paralyze our economy and kill our jobs. People have, for the hope of peace are willing to lose their livelihoods. I've seen where tomorrow Neiman Marcus is going to file bankruptcy and you're going to see a trend of another uh, uh, business and another business and another business in America filing bankruptcy because they have no customers coming in their stores because their stores have been mandated closed, not essential. My dear friends, it's happening all over the country and what companies will find is they can run leaner and some that have been laid off and lost their job, they won't be offered it back when this thing does open up. And can I say, a lot of these liberal politicians don't want to open it up. 
I said it this morning. When this thing was shut down, they said it would be for 14 days till the curve is flattened. Then they extended it to 30 days. Uh, can I say it is more than flattened. It is peaked. It is flattened. Uh, it is on a downward spiral for 14 straight days. Uh, it has went down the death total. Uh, but yet the liberal politicians are saying, now we need more testing. Now we need more testing. Why do they want this thing to go on? Because it hurts the president and his hope for re-election if the economy is running good. They couldn't get Trump on Russia Gate. They couldn't get Trump uh, on impeachment. Uh, uh, if they can keep the economy shut down, they know it hurts his chances because people always vote their pocketbook. Mm, come on, you're not foolish, are you? You do look around and see what's really happening here. There have been doctor after doctor and scientist after scientist who have said this is just another strain of the flu. And every week for the last three weeks, uh, they've come out and their models and their totals for death has went down, 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 down. And now they even lost another 12% over the weekend, said it's going to be 12% smaller than we thought it was. After they started out saying we was going to have 2 million. We just barely have 40,000. That's 40,000 people that died. And I certainly do grieve for their families. But can I say in the same time period we've had over 80,000 die of the flu? How many people have died in car wrecks? How many babies have been aborted? Mm -mm. Why are they making a mountain out of this thing? Because they want to kill America. You see, wicked politicians have wanted a global America for generations. Obama thought he'd had, had it all set up and Hillary was going to take us there. But God gave us a little space of grace. But all you got to do is keep forfeiting your rights for the hope of peace. And we'll have that global economy. And America will cease being America. Look what happened to Argentina. and Look what happened to all the socialist countries of the world. Their economies are in the tank. And America's is headed there for the hope of peace. Some will forfeit their liberty. Some will forfeit their legacy. Some will forfeit their livelihood. Some will forfeit their lifestyles. How much has changed in America in the last month and a half? You can't go to any sporting events. You can't go to a movie theater. You can't go out and sit down and have a meal at a restaurant. Hmm. It's amazing. We used to make fun of fast food being the lowest uh, common denominator of food, and everybody's living on it now. Hmm? Huh? Everybody used to say, boy, I wish we'd go back to Andy Griffith days where we'd sit on the porch and we'd eat dinner around the dinner table. After about three weeks of that, people were tired of that. Hmm? Mom was tired of cooking. We're tired of watching the traffic go down the street. Are you listening? We want something to do. But yet a lot of people, they're satisfied in being all curled up in their living room, scared to death of the boogeyman waiting for him outside. It's funny, we was out yesterday. We saw this, this lady at Kroger. She had a mask on. A lot of people wearing masks. It was amazing. First of all, they said you didn't need to wear a mask. Wouldn't help. Then they said, only if you get the virus, wear a mask so you don't spread to somebody else. And now everybody has to wear a mask. We saw this goofy lady wearing a mask yesterday, and it was down below her nose. How's that going to help her? Hmm? Huh? Hello, if you're going to wear the stupid thing, wear it right. huh? I'm thinking she's got more than coronavirus. She messed up. huh? They come with instruction. Two little straps over your ears to rest over your face. Not real tough, huh? But I guess she's a hillbilly, redneck. She didn't know how to figure it out. Hmm? Now listen, you can't go sit down at a restaurant and eat. You can't go shopping. Hmm. Can't go to the barber. Lord have mercy, open it and sing up. Need to get to the barber. Thank God for Miss Renee. She cut it once. She's about ready. To, I get about every two weeks and I'm there, huh? Listen, can't go to hair salons. My poor daughter, she can't go get her eyelashes done, her nails done. She's been finding folks to help her out. She learned how to do her eyelashes herself. What a blessing, huh? I'm just telling you, this thing, it's got everybody's lifestyle messed up. Well, what about folks that had to have hip replacement surgery, but they can't go to physical therapy? You know what doctors are saying? Now they're going to have to have a second surgery replacing the hip that they already replaced. Hmm? 
What about people with knee replacement surgeries? Can't go to therapy. What about folks that need something dire like a knee replacement? Some other surgery that they don't deem essential. Hmm? They just keep pushing it all off. And all this push about our first responders, and thank God for our first responders. But a lot of doctors and a lot of nurses are being furloughed in doctor's offices and in emergency rooms. And, in the, and, and what about uh, 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 this whole thing about flattening the curve was to make sure we didn't overrun the hospitals. We hadn't even come close to uh, capacity in hospitals. We had more people in the hospitals before they shut it down than what we got right now. You see, our lifestyles have changed. People can't go on vacation. I did see where North Carolina, or I mean, where South Carolina and, and Florida was opening up some of their beaches. What a blessing! But you can't travel there because the governor won't let you back in the state. Uh, quarantine me on a beach for about 14 days. That'd be all right, huh? Well, I'm just telling you, life has changed, and you know what? A lot of people don't care for the hope of peace and safety. They'll forfeit their lifestyles. Then I thought about this lastly. For the hope of peace, some will forfeit their loyalty. Hmm. It's amazing when everything goes well and everybody's on the mountaintop how much they love Jesus. But you hit a valley, you'll find out who really loves Jesus. A lot of people's loyalty is being called into question. Their loyalty to the Savior. They love Jesus as long as it doesn't cost them anything. Their loyalty to the sanctuary. Boy, I hope everybody's right. I hope when this thing opens up, the church houses are filled. But I've been around a long time. And I'm telling you, the longer this thing goes on, the more people get used to not being in church. There's some. They're never coming back. Why? It's a question of loyalty. Say, well, I'm just afraid I'll get sick if I'm around a crowd. Yet they'll go to Walmart, they'll go to Kroger's. Uh, they won't come to church. Hmm? They sure don't want to go to heaven. There's going to be a big crowd there. Hmm? Talking about the loyalty. Loyalty to the Savior, their loyalty to the sanctuary, their loyalty to the scriptures at a time when people ought to be in their Bible more than ever before. Many aren't seeking after God. Can I say the loyalty of their standards? There are some things we used to say we would never back up on, yet so many have. I'm talking about preachers. Preachers have lowered their standards because they're afraid of the conflict. Some preachers act like live streams the greatest thing since sliced bread. I want to tell you something. I hate it. The Bible commanded us to assemble and not forsaking the assembly. I miss the people of God worshiping together. Hmm. I miss the fellowship time. I miss the taking up of the offering time, seeing the kids get the baskets. I miss Sunday school. I miss all those things that they say is non-essential. They don't know me. They don't know our lifestyle. And yet so many will give away their standards for the new norm. Well, I remember what Jeremiah said. He said, get back to the old past. That's the good way. Can I say some will forfeit their loyalty of service. Regardless of the climate of the world, we're still commanded to take the gospel to every creature. And we're still commanded to fulfill the Great Commission. And my dear friends, there are so many people that that is the farthest thing from their minds is getting the gospel out. What better time to get the gospel out than right now when people are more susceptible to listen. Hezekiah said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? He said, I really don't care about the world. I don't care about my legacy, my children. I don't care about anything as long as I got it good. He wanted peace without conflict. Can I say we live in a day and age where soft Christians are in the same boat. They want peace without conflict. God give us some Christians with some backbone. God give us some Christians who are willing to 
to say, I'll face whatever for the honor and glory of Jesus, that the gospel continues to go forth and that we leave a legacy of we really believed what the Bible taught. God help us to long for Jesus more than peace and safety. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we bless you. Lord, I pray those that were watching, those that were listening, their purpose in their, their heart to be that one that Ezekiel spoke of when he said, God sought for a man to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. God, we need folks that are willing to be uncomfortable, yet right with God. Lord, we live in such a day of uncertainty, and instead of people running to God, it seems like people are cowering down in the corners and running away from God. God, help us. Oh, God, help us. Increase our faith. God, dissipate our doubts. God, draw us close to Thee. And God, help us to, having done all to stand, stand therefore in the evil day. Now, God, there are folks whose souls are in the balance. And our stand is what will make a difference on them trusting Christ or not. God, for those that so readily and so easily embrace peace rather than conflict, I pray you'd convict them. Help them to realize there's a legacy worth leaving and it's not a legacy of peace and safety, but it's a legacy of a love for God above all else. God, I do thank you for the liberties we have in our country and the liberty we have in Christ. And I do pray for our governor and these governors that, Lord, they'd open up the economy. They would quit putting their hands upon God's people and upon churches. And God, I pray we'd see great revival break out because of people who did not sell out but for people who stood for righteousness and for your name's sake. Bless those that were watching. Anybody that wasn't saved, I pray you'd convict them and save them. I pray for those that were saved, you'd charge them up, give them a cause in their soul to want to stand for the things of God. Help us this day to determine in our hearts we're going to put you first every day of our lives, come what may. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for first loving us. We thank you for your truth and your precepts. Bless now as only you can. Get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. Thank you again for tuning in. God bless you. Keep looking up. Keep praying. I'm praying the next steps for us and what God would have us to do. Bless your heart. Until Wednesday night, keep looking up. Jesus is coming soon. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.